Let us now take some time and discuss some common stock characteristics with an emphasis on dividends. <laughs> Slide number 61, a stock spin-off. What is a stock spin-off? Well, that's a conversion of one of a firm's subsidiaries to a standalone company by distribution of stock in that new company to existing shareholders. So, so the, the company is saying, hey, it makes sense for us to split into two or three parts. And you, as a shareholder of the original company, get to keep your shares, but then you get shares in the new company or companies. Sometimes the new company is still majority owned by the company that spun it off. You see, they're not dumb if they see their young child going off into the world, but they see very good things for it. They'll hang on to quite a bit of the stock. Recently, uh, Kraft, you've heard of them. They were spun off by Altria. Altria, who, that's the that's the name for Philip Morris. They changed their name, well, I don't know, about 10, 12 years ago. And they owned Kraft and they owned Miller. They spun that off, but they still own quite a bit of that company. <laughs> and why did they do that? Why did they spin off Kraft? Well, there were many people who just simply will never buy a tobacco company. But here was a tobacco company that owned the world's second largest food company at the time. And so they said, well, this is kind of uh, limiting ourselves. Let's spin off Kraft so that people who don't have a problem buying food companies can buy it. They then, Altria, divested themselves of the international tobacco business. And that company is now called Philip Morris International. And to give you an idea of how topsy-turvy the world is, Philip Morris International is based in the United States, but sells cigarettes outside the United States. Altria is the company that sells the cigarette, the Marlboro, in the United States. Plus, Kraft has now spun off, I, I have a hard time, it, it looks French, it looks Mondelez, but they, they pronounce it Mondelez. And that's the company that now uh, runs all the snack foods, like Oreos and Triscuits and the things. So, oh my goodness, it gets crazy. The history of spinoffs has been checkered. Some spinoffs have spin offs have done better than the companies that spun them off. And a tremendous example of this are the Baby Bells. Many of you before you were born uh, uh, don't don't know this before you, because it happened before you were born. But AT&T used to be one big company, the telephone company here in the United States. And in 1984, they broke it up and we had AT&T and all the Baby Bells. Um, the Baby Bells were Pacific Bell and Bell South and Ameritech and and uh, and uh, what was the one that became Verizon Bell Atlantic and and the one that became AT and T the new AT and T was called SBC Communications and what happened is they started buying each other up and now we basically have two of the original Baby Bells who have gotten huge that's Verizon and SBC Communications. And SBC Communications got so big that they bought AT&T, the old AT&T, just to grab the name. Believe that. Anyway, figure that one. Now, some spinoffs have not done so well. Coca-Cola Enterprises, which was spun off from Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola Enterprises is the company that actually bottles the, 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 the Coke. They don't make the Coke. They bottle it. And Lucent Technologies, which was... Uh, used to be called Western Electric Bell Labs. They were part of AT&T, and they were spun off from AT&T. And they've been examples both of disappointments. So often they do well, but sometimes not so well. A stock split on slide 62. Now, this is, this is important, folks, because there's a little bit of, a, of intrigue going on here. A stock split is a maneuver in which a company increases the number of shares outstanding by exchanging a specified number of new shares of stock for each outstanding, outstanding share. So uh, there are lots of different stock splits, but two for one is typical. You have 100 shares, and one day we have, you wake up and you now have 200 shares. Yippee! No, no, no. 
the price went down from $20 to $10. So sure, you're getting more shares, but the price just goes down commensurate. Did I say that right? <laughs> commensurate with the number of shares that you, uh, additional shares that you received. And there are three for one splits, three for two splits, one for five splits. You know, a reverse split it's called. Just simply put, there is no increased value from stock splits. If you had one share at $20, you now ha have two shares at $10, the value is still 20 bucks. It is a psychological increase at best. And there used to be a technological reason, a, a reason to have the stock split just because it made trading in 100 share increments easier and that's when people did face-to-face -face trading but we don't do face-to-face -face trading anymore it's all electronic so what do you care you the answer is you don't and the sage of omaha warren buffett since the 1960s has always thought that this was an accounting gimmick that he really disliked so he refused to split his stock uh, berkshire hathaway since its inception, he has refused to split the stock, and consequently, subsequently, a single share now goes for around $145,000. And you say, oh my goodness, that's outrageous. But no, that's typical. If GE or Coca-Cola or these other long-standing large companies that have been around for decades and will continue to be around for decades, if they had refused to split their stock since their inception, a single share would go for whatever, 100000 or whatever. So you, we will see fewer and fewer splits now because of there's not the need to, to do it for technology. Um, sometimes you see a company split their stock at least this is what this is what I think. I don't, I don't know if I'm right, but it sure seems that way. When they believe that things are looking good and they're trying to tell the world that, yeah, we, we things are looking pretty good for us. Now, why did they split the stock to do that? And why don't they just come out and say things are looking good? Because you know why. Because if they say things are looking good and then they don't turn out so well, they can get sued by by ambulance chasing lawyers saying you or you told these people you were trying to deceive them we're going to sue you pay us a hundred thousand dollars to go away so they will split the stock as a way of saying you know things are looking pretty good for us uh, i noticed that happened a few years ago with qualcomm uh, they split the stock for no apparent reason i mean it didn't need to it wasn't even trading that high and and then it turned out that the next few years Qualcomm did pretty well. They were they internationally they were increasing their uh, market share and the like outside the United States. Did very well for themselves. So so watch for those stock splits. But remember, they don't mean anything. But do you have to understand them? Yes, you do. Right. You have now have twice a two for one split. You now have twice as many shares at half the price. Slide number sixty. Three, Treasury stocks. Hmm, what is, tre not, nothing to do with the United States Treasury, folks, or Treasury bonds or anything like that. Sh treasury stocks are shares of stock that have been sold and subsequently repurchased by the issuing firm. They're sometimes called share buybacks or just simply buybacks. And share buybacks reduce the number of outstanding shares. Now, now why would a company want to do this? Well, the logic being that after the buyback, there is less supply of outstanding stock. Hmm? Right. Existing shareholders now have a larger percentage ownership of the corporation. Exactly. And you econ students, what happens when you reduce the supply of a certain item? Assuming the demand doesn't change, the price should rise. Exactly. During the run-up of the 1990s, share buybacks were often seen as a better alternative to dividend increases. The belief was that investors were more interested in capital gains than dividends, and that 
buybacks increase the potential for capital gains by reducing the supply of stock. Now, in practice, does it always work that way? No, sometimes the company, I don't know, whatever, uh, the stock price is high already for whatever reason. The, the, the market's in a giddy uh, state. Um, you know, everybody's feeling really excited and stocks are selling at very high uh, uh, valuations. And so the companies buy back their shares when they're high. Does that make sense? No. So, so sometimes it does work and sometimes it doesn't work out so well. Slide number 64, classifications of common stock, classified common stock. Well, sometimes, especially when the company is very large, common stock will be issued by a company in different classes, each of which offers different privileges and benefits to its holder. There'll be a class A shares, class B shares. Sound familiar? Kind of like the mutual funds, but not exactly the same. Um, the class A shares of a, of a company might be the common stock that is av available to everybody. And the class B shares might be this common stock that is only available to the family that, that, uh, that originally owned the company and, and took it public. And the class B shares might pay a, a, uh, an, an enhanced dividend, but may have no voting rights. So, so there are all different types of combinations and permutations of this. At one time, GM, I think, had seven different classifications. The old GM, this was several years ago. Seven, seven different classifications of stocks. And here's an example, Berkshire Hathaway. The Class A are the original shares. Now, recall they're selling for over, whatever, $145,000 each. Well, that makes it difficult to buy a share, doesn't it, for for the uh, for the lowly uh, little people like you and me? And so the financial world pressed Warren Buffett to offer a lower cost version of his stock. He didn't want to do it, but he went out. He went. This was twenty years ago or so, and um, he did it. And he said, "All right, we'll make a class B shares." But they'll sell for three thousand dollars, thirty-three hundred, which is not what the Wall Street folks had in mind. In the prospectus, Buffett said he wouldn't buy them. So here's a guy who's coming out with a new classification of his company stock and telling people not to buy it. That tells you that this man is an honest man. But you know, he he was sort of doing it to to make the, the investment world happy. And then it turned out that. He actually, it worked out for him well, very well, because he wanted to use his shares as a way to buy other companies, which is typical. People, companies will use their shares as a form of currency because the thing, whatever they're worth, they're worth, whatever the market is willing to pay for them. But the problem is when you have currency that is in such huge increments, 145,000 or 34th, whatever, whatever it had gotten up to, I forget exactly what it had gotten up to. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult to do that. It's difficult to to uh, to use them because you do, it doesn't translate well because you got you have one currency that's really huge and and the other stock is is much smaller. So he recently split those Class B shares forty for one, forty for one, so that he could use them as currency to buy other companies. And so now they sell for around around ninety eight dollars last time I checked. So he now has a stock that. You and I can buy. But wait a minute, wait a minute, folks. Can you and I actually buy the Class A shares? It turns out we can. There are companies that have gone out and bought Berkshire Hathaway shares at 100 and whatever, 140, whatever they are, happen to be selling at. And then if you come up with a couple thousand dollars, they will just simply sell you 0.05 shares. Do you understand? <laughs> they will break up the shares into little bitty pieces in the thousands and sell you thousands of the shares. And they do the bookkeeping, and I'm sure they charge you for it accordingly because they're doing the work. So, uh, so yeah, you can even if it even if the price goes way high, out of the reach of the little people, we the little people can still buy the shares. Slide number 65. Now some common stock values. We will do a few calculations in chapter 5, but the vast majority of our calculations are going to be done in chapter 6. And we'll discuss 
evaluation in detail when we get to chapter six. But what you will see are, are some numbers that, some of which are meaningless. For example, par value. This is the stated or face value of a stock. And it might be a buck, it might be a cent. I don't really understand, to be truthful, I don't really understand why they assign this value to the shares. Um, for me, it's fairly meaningless. What it reminds me of is our is the phenomenon you see with uh, manufacturers' cents off coupons. If you look on the back, it'll say uh, value is 0 0.001 cent. And, and supposedly this happened because people would send in the 50 cent coupon and say, thank you for the 50 cents, send me the 50 cents. They didn't use the coupon to actually buy the product. So the company would say, well, that's not what the idea was. You're supposed to buy the product and we'll give you 50 cents off. So, so what they did is they put this little meaningless number on the back, 0 0.001 cent. So if you send them in a thousand coupons, they'll give you a penny. So um, I think that's what it, I don't really know. If anybody can tell me, I'd be happy to. It's not important. Uh, the book value, I know this is something more important. This is the amount of shareholders equity in a firm. It equals the amount of the firm's assets minus the firm's liability and the preferred stock, if there are any preferred stock. And so those of you in the Business 121 class, if you've taken the Business 121 class, or if you've taken accounting, you know that assets minus liabilities equals equity is what the accountants call it. In the Business 121 class, we call it net worth. And that's what we call it uh, in stocks. We call, what we call it in stocks is book value. What is it worth to us on the books, right? You go in, look at the, the firm's assets, look at the firm's liabilities. Now, this number is reported in the media, and I ask you to look it up in Chapter 5 assignment. It's under Key Statistics, if you use Yahoo, folks. And what you will find is it is almost always far less than the actual market value, the price, the prevailing market value of the security. And why is that? Why is the stock worth more in the open market trading uh, between investors than the book value? Well, that makes perfect sense when you think about it. When you think about it, a small company such as a pizza shop or a shoe shine shop or whatever, the value of the assets minus the liabilities is normally not that big, depending on the company. It's usually, I mean, the pots and the pans, the, the, the tableware. They don't usually own the building. The pizza shop doesn't. They rent that. So doesn't it make more sense for the company to be intact than, uh, than if you were to sell off all the assets, buy, pay off the liabilities, and walk away? And that's obviously the case for the mass, vast majority of companies. When it is not the case, when we see the book value go above the market value, that's usually a very bad sign. That means the investors don't believe that the company is worth what's on the what the assets are in in the, what it possesses. That's a bad sign. And when that happens, often the company becomes a takeover target by corporate raiders who are happy <laughs> to sell off all the assets, pay off all the liabilities, put the company out of business, and walk away with extra money in their pocket. You understand? And so that is a situation that happens rarely, but when it does happen, it, 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 makes, it gives capitalism a bad name. From especially if you're an employee at the company, because <laughs> because uh, if you're an employee at a company that's been around for whatever, some of you might have heard of a company called Simplicity. The name still survives, but the company disappeared over what over thirty about thirty years ago. And for 150 years, this company was selling things that people needed until they didn't need it anymore. Um, if you go into your grandmother's attic or garage or whatever, or you might find a Singer sewing machine. Yeah, Singer. It was a, a sewing machine company. And because before the 1970s, 1980s or so, people used to make their own clothes. They would buy some clothes, but, but they would make their own clothes. And Simplicity was the company that sold you the patterns. Right. And they had been around forever. And now with automation, 
it didn't make sense for people to make their own clothes. They were just, it was just so much cheaper for the, the computers machines to make it and, and sell them to you. So Simplicity and Singer and all the companies that were associated with this technology basically were disappearing. So in the early 80s, Simplicity's market value was below its book value. And corporators swooped in, bought up enough shares to own the company, sold the, off the assets, uh, paid off the liabilities, and walked away with money in their pocket. Now, how would you feel if you were an employee of that company? Or if that company were based in your town and now all those people are unemployed and that has a ripple effect on, on the businesses that exactly... And you are not happy! <laughs> so you complain to your erected representatives and they say well we have to do something to protect these jobs and you wait no you don't understand capitalists the um, the economists the corporate raiders would tell you that company was not efficiently using society's capital well it needed to be plowed under it needed to be destroyed creative destruction and that capital released and you say well i got to feed my kids, okay, excuse me. And that is why we have unemployment insurance, folks. We want companies to be plowed under. We want that capital to be unlocked. But at the same time, we want people to be able to put food on the table. So so you, it, these systems that we put in place, sometimes there, there are un, always unintended consequences. But uh, especially when there's a prolonged downturn, as there has been the last several years, we're not using unemployment insurance as a way to not to pay people not to work that's not the the idea the idea is to have that safety net so that we can put people out of work and have them find a better use for their time and a better use for the capital that was locked up makes sense okay enough of the lecture oh let's continue slide number 66 dividends oh boy don't we love dividends these are shares of earnings given to stockholders. Um, they're normally paid quarterly in the United States and com countries that, that were either previous colonies or had something to do with the United Kingdom, the England. They are paid quarterly. Canada, Hong Kong, Australia. Um, other countries will pay them semi-annually every six months some countries pay them once a year yeah so just remember that united states and other countries associated with the uk are paid quarterly the board of directors decides how much if any dividend should be paid and when to pay them so 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 remember dividends are not mandatory unlike interest payments from a bond Right, those are mandatory. If you don't, if the bond issuer doesn't pay the the bond interest, then they're in default and they could be dragged into uh, bankruptcy court. Uh, dividends are usually a percentage of the earnings per share. Hmm, what's this earnings per share? Well, we're going to do a few little calculations, and there's a worksheet that you'll eventually do. But the earn, but the, you don't have to do the calculations. Why? Because you just look it up. It's too easy. The earnings per share are the amount of annual earnings available to common stockholders as stated on a per share basis. In other words, you buy one share, how much did that one share earn? It's easy to, 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 to uh, see that my little one share earns 50 cents. I just look it up. Or you can do the calculation. And so that allows your little one share to, to be thought of as its own little, little engine of, of, of earnings. So slide number 67. Here's an example of earnings per share. We have a company that reports net profit of a million dollars. Yippee! Is that a lot of money? Well, to you and me, it's a lot of money. But, but is it a lot of money with regard to how many shares are outstanding? Well, we have to know that. There are 500,000 shares outstanding. So we take the earnings divided by the number of shares, $1 million of earnings divided by $500,000 shares, 500, I'm sorry, did I say 500,000 shares, my apologies, and we have $2 earnings per share. Now, the board of directors might decide to pay out 50% of the earnings per share in the form of dividends. That's their decision. 
Therefore, each shareholder would receive a dollar dividend for each share they own. You own one share, you get a buck. You own 10 shares, you get $10. 100 shares? Exactly. 100 shares. $100. This is called the dividend payout ratio. The company is paying out 50% of their earnings to dividend shareholders in the form of dividends. And that's easy to compute, right? A dollar of dividends divided by $2 of earnings. Now, what's typical? 50% is not unusual for companies that have been around for a long time and are not growing. But companies that are growing usually very uh, are very reticent to pay out the money in dividends. Why? Because they need it to grow the company. So, so you'll see 50% is not unusual. 30% not unusual. It's unusual it gets over 70 or 80% unless the company just has cash coming out of their ears. <laughs> they don't know what to do with it. And they've been around a long time and they just decide, okay, it's time to give it back to the, to the, to the owners of the company. Uh, slide number 68, dividend yield. Very important number. We will, you're going to look up dividend yield and we will discuss this vis-a-vis -vis other investments. The dividend yield is a measure that relates dividends to share price and puts stock dividends on a relative percentage basis rather than an absolute dollar basis. You see, it's great to know that you're getting a buck per share, but we need to relate that to how much we had to pay for that dollar. If the stock in the previous slide that was paying a dollar dividend if that were selling for $20, the dividend yield would be 5%. And it's a very simple calculation. And again, you don't have to do it. Be, I mean, I'm going to ask you to do it, but you just look it up. A dollar dividend divided by $20 price, if the stock were selling for $20, that would be a 5% dividend. And why is that so important? Well, because it makes it easier or easy to compare stocks with other income-oriented vehicles, such as bonds or savings accounts. So you could say, yeah, my bond is paying me 3%, but this stock is paying me 4%. Well, what's the difference between the bond and the stock? Right, the stock dividend is optional. The company next quarter, if they're in the United States and they pay quarterly, they could just say, we're not going to pay it. Whereas the bond has to continue to pay that, that dividend. Traditionally, and I want you to remember this, 3 to 6% was normal. That was normal. Is that normal now? No, it's about 2 to 3%, you know. In the 1990s, dividends went to 1% or less. In 2000, March of 2000, at the height of the stock bubble, they went to 1%. Uh, we're talking about the Standard & Poor's 500 now, the 500 largest companies in the United States. Some companies paid zero. Some companies paid, some companies paid more. Dividends then went above 3% in the 2008 to 2009 turmoil, and now they're back down to just above 2% or so. But remember, some companies pay uh, very healthy dividends, and some companies pay zero dividends. And there's always this tug of war. Uh, people love dividends. Well, not many of us, I love dividends. And other people say, no, 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 don't pay out dividends. I want you to reinvest the... the uh, money back in the company and if you can't do that buy back the shares and that's because I want capital gains I want uh, the company's price the stock price to go up uh, so you see that the tug of war that companies have to deal with slide number 69 now let's see if you can stick with me on this one okay it's a little tricky but for the most part it's pretty meaningless there are important dates with regards to stocks there's the declaration date. Now, that's the date that the board of declare, direct, directors declares the dividends. And they say, today we are declaring that we are going to pay dividends, you know, in, in, the, in a few weeks in the future. They, they don't do it the same day. And, and that's to give people opportunity to, to digest that information and decide if they want the dividend. They could buy the shares. If they don't want the dividend, they can sell the shares. And they declare a date of record. This is the date on which an investor must be registered share, shareholder of a firm to be entitled to receive the dividend. So we're going to set, I, forget, I think I did June 18th. I do June 18th on the next slide. I can remember, forget, remember. We're going to set a certain date and you have to be a shareholder of record to receive that dividend. Now, 
Hmm, what's going on here? The next one is called X dividend date. This is three days before the date of record. You have to own the shares or buy the shares three days before the date of record. And this is the actual date that determines whether one is an official shareholder of a firm and thus eligible to receive a declared dividend. X dividend is three days before. Now, why is that? Hang on a minute. We'll discuss that in the next slide. The last one is the payment date, and that's the actual date. That's a couple of weeks later after the date of record of which the company pays the dividend. Okay, so that's the actual date that you get the money, and that's not for a few weeks after the, uh, the uh, date of record. So now, slide number 70. Why is the ex-dividend date three days before the date of record? Well, that's because stock transactions close in three days. You buy the stock on June 15th. You actually do not get the stock until June 18th. It used to be five business days. It used to be, now it's three business days. And they could probably sometime in the future, because now everything's electronic, they'll lower it again. But it's three business days. You buy the stock on June 15th. You don't actually get it until June 18th. So theoretically, <laughs> this is theoretically, folks, the opening share price on the ex-dividend date should reflect a drop in price commiserate. No, that should be commensurate. i got to change that. Commensurate with the amount of the dividend. I knew I didn't say it right the last I did say it right the last time, but I didn't say it right this time. I have to change that. Commensurate, not commis commiserate, is when you, 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 you sit down with somebody who just had crashed their car and you say, oh, I'm so sorry. That's <laughs> i got to fix that. If there is a dollar per share dividend, the opening stock price should be reduced by a buck. You understand? Because they're going to take a dollar out of their piggy bank and send it to each shareholder that owns one share, right? So they're going to, whatever many shares they have to pay. But that doesn't really work that way, right? Because the, the, the prices are changing all the time. So, so this is just theoretical. Next slide, slide number 71. Don't buy the dividend is a common saying in the industry. The translation is you are often better off waiting until the X dividend date before buying a stock. Why? Here's the logic. Now, I don't, I'm not saying I agree with it, folks. I'm just telling you this is what you're going to hear, and this is what people are going to tell you, and then you have to decide whether or not you, you think it means anything. I, I think in the long term, it doesn't mean much of anything. But here's the logic. Dividends are taxable transactions. If you buy the dividend, you buy the stock just before the ex-dividend date, you will be responsible for paying the tax. And presumably, the stock price will fall commensurate <laughs> with the amount of the dividend. So, you are better off waiting until after the ex-dividend date so that you will get, a stock, get the stock at a better price and not generate the taxable transaction. Now, sure, if you have tons of money and you're moving it around just to make money on individual, small little movements, you, first of all, you're going to get killed with transaction costs, in my humble opinion, but whatever, then I guess this makes perfect sense. If you're renting the stock for a few weeks or a few months and not wanting to own the stock for five years or more, sure, this is good advice. But if if you're the kind of person, the kind of investor that I hope you will become that loves dividends and, and thinks of it as a long-term relationship, you want to own the stock, not rent it, then this is not a big deal. Because first of all, you and I are not going to be using, are not going to be having <laughs> huge sums of money moved around. And, uh, and secondly, you, you like dividends. If they're in a retirement account, you don't care because the IRS doesn't come calling until you retire anyway. And if it's in a Roth, then they never come calling. So there you go. So I, so I, I don't think it's a big deal, but other people will. You have to decide what you think. Slide number 72. Now, this is very important, folks. If only to protect yourself against some, I shouldn't use this word, uh, disreputable or un, 
cagey, sneaky, but I, d d d d d you, you decide afterwards. Slide number 72. There are two types of dividends. Cash dividends, which is what you want. You want cash. If you, ne if you ne remember nothing else, what you know, what you, re you remember is you want your payments of dividends in the form of cash. They are taxable transactions, yes, but you still want your payment in the form of cash. Because there are some companies that will pay you with what are called stock dividends. This is payment of a dividend in the form of additional shares of stock. But wait a minute, all else being equal, and of course it never is, stock dividends have no value because they constitute a dilution of ownership. They're kind of like a stock split. So, for example, the board of director declares the board of directors declares a 10% stock dividend. For every 10 shares, you receive one extra share. Yippee! <laughs> the price of the shares drop 10%. It, think of it like a stock split. But unlike a cash dividend, a stock dividend is not taxed. Well, gee, thank you very much. You're not taxing me, IRS, on something that is worthless. Isn't that kind of the IRS not to tax us on something that isn't worth anything? So do you want cash dividends or do you want stock dividends? Yes, you do. You want cash dividends. Remember that. And I do want you to, re to remember this difference just in case somebody comes up to you and says, Hey, hey, I just got a stock and they paid me 10% dividends. Was it in the form of cash or stock? It was in the form of stock, but it's 10%. And don't try to bring them down slowly to make them understand that they really didn't get anything. Okay. Tell them first that they didn't get uh, taxed on it. That, that'll make them feel better. And then you can tell them the truth. Slide number 73. Now, this is very important, especially for us long-term uh, buy and hold type investors. They are called dividend reinvestment plans. And they have great, I just love that name, DRIP. Do you want a DRIP? I, I think you do. These are plans in which shareholders have their cash dividends automatically reinvested into additional shares of the firm's common stock. Now, it sounds like a stock dividend. It is not. It is a cash dividend, and it is taxable. There were no additional shares that were issued. There's no dilution of ownership. The company had to go out and buy the shares on the open market to give you your, you know, whatever in the form of whatever the amount is in the form of cash your cash dividends in the form of shares i'm sorry they had to go out on the open market buy the shares and they didn't create new shares they went out and bought those shares and they gave you whatever in in terms of cash your shares are worth and on the website is a great uh, example of uh, san diego gas and electric sempra a dividend reinvestment plan where you go directly to the company. Now, they don't do it. They have somebody do it for them. But you go to these large cap companies. Most of, the, most of them are large companies, well-established companies. And you say, I, I'd like to have a di dividend reinvestment plan with your company. And they say, sure, here's the website. Now, we don't do it. Somebody does it on our behalf. And they will, uh, instead of paying you dividends in the form of cash, they will reinvest that cash back in additional shares. So I want you to take a look at that. There's a commentary. Drips are an excellent way to own stock for those interested in a long-term growth and are not, in, not don't need the current income. They don't need the dividends to live off of. It allows the investor to take advantage of compounding automatically with normally no or very small transaction costs. It, the, the, uh, the, the drip that I belong to with another with a group of other investors in the club I used to belong to, we would sometimes get hit with six, per, six cents. Six cents, folks, or nine cents, because it just cost them so very little to run this, this program, and they, they took the costs and, and they put them on you, but still, it was, it was nothing. And investing in a company like General Electric or Johnson & Johnson or Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company, in this way is almost like investing in a mutual fund because mutual funds automatically reinvest the dividends and the capital gains back into the mutual fund. So you could think of stocks that are large companies that have many different divisions and many different um, uh, companies within the company as a mutual fund and a very very great way to build wealth 
slowly over time. And so do you remember the slide that showed you you know, a dozen years or 25 years or 16 years where the stock market basically as measured by any imperfect measurements that we talked about in the previous presentation. Do you, do you see how now we can we can uh, have optimism during those long periods where the market, as people say, doesn't do anything, even though it went up and down like crazy? Right. We don't care about that. We simply buy high quality companies on a um, uh, per periodic basis as the money comes in 50 bucks 100 bucks more if we can afford it and we allow the dividend reinvestment plans to reinvest the dividends in more shares and we can make money even when the market doesn't do anything how could you be so invested in stocks they haven't done anything in 15 years oh yes they have <laughs> they've been paying me dividends Okay, well, all right, enough of that. All right, so you see, as Mr. Rockefeller says, you know what gets me excited is when my dividend checks come in. Slide number 74. Let us end this uh, third um, presentation of Chapter 5 with a, the introduction to price-to-earnings ratio. Now, we've already discussed price-to-earnings ratio a little bit, and I told you you wouldn't understand. That was back in Chapter 4. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this puppy, folks, because this is the most watched stock market statistic. The price divided by the earnings, the P-E ratio, uh, sometimes written as P slash E, sometimes just written as P-E. It's a very simple calculation. And again, you're going to learn how to do it, but it, you just look it up. Price divided by earnings per share. So if we go back to the previous example and we had $20 price and $2 earnings per share, that would be 20 divided by 2 or 10. Now don't put dollar sign, don't put a percent sign. It is unit list. So just put the number. But if you, you know, a lot of you put the dollar sign or the percent sign, don't do it. Uh, 10 PE. Now is that high? Is that low? Well, traditionally stocks sold for PE ratios of 5 to 15, 5 to 14, 7 to 14. And a PE of 20 was only reserved for the fastest growing stocks. Well, during the 1980s and 90s and in the late 1920s and then late 1960s, PEs that were higher of 20 were not unusual. And then when the organic matter hits the ventilating device, the PE has come down drastically. <laughs> And in the 2008 turmoil, PDE ratios came down greatly. So we will discuss PE in much more detail. What you know for now is that it's price divided by earnings per share. That's the calculation. I'm going to ask you to do one or two. It's not that hard to do on the worksheet number two. Is it worksheet number two? And typically was 5 to 15, but more and more you see 14, 15, 16. I'm going to ask you to look at this up, right? And then for fast-growing companies, above 20, okay? When we come back, we'll finish up Chapter 5 with discussing the different types of common stocks and some strategies for investing. Study hard, folks. I know it's a lot of material, but you've got to do it every day. Listen to the presentations, watch the presentations, read the book, make notes for yourself, and and study because it, it takes repetition. You just some there are some people, few people who once you they hear something, once they read something, boom, they have it. I ain't one of them, <laughs> and there are not that many of them. It's less than ten percent of a population. Usually, sometimes up depends on the population, but usually it's less than ten percent of the population. Most all of us. Regular people must repeat, must study, and that's how you learn. Do well, folks. Study hard and bring honor and glory to Southwestern Community College. See you in the last and final, the next and final presentation of Chapter 5.